A classic problem in business intelligence is given a, uh, some website or some uh, post on a website or in a social network, uh, we'd like to know as much as possible about the person who posted because we'd like to market something to them. We'd like to convince them to do something, buy something. Uh, obviously, this also has forensic applications and uh, applications to historical problems. Uh, we'll think mostly about the, uh, the business applications uh, over here. So this is work that I've done over many years, with, uh, mainly with uh, Jonathan Schler and Shlomo Argaman and, and many of our students. So let's start with a uh, Hashini. That one. OK. This is a real post on uh, some social network. Take a look at it. So what can you tell me about, uh, about the person who wrote this post? It's not really a, th this, is, this isn't one of the harder problems we're going to have to face. OK. You can look at this and say, OK, yeah, that looks like what? Oh, is somebody religious because she believes in God? Yeah. No. I, I, I think, I think it, at, least, at, least, at least to me, it's pretty obvious that we're dealing with a female American teenager, right? I think that, that's a, this is a pretty easy one, right? Um, but let's think of something like this, OK? This is the kind of problem that we really want to deal with, a lot harder than, than the stereotypical one we just saw before. I gave you, I'm giving you the first paragraph of two articles in, a, uh, in an English literature uh, journal. Okay? I can tell you that one of them is written by a man, and another one, uh, the other one is written by a woman. Uh, uh, does anybody want to venture a guess as to which of these is by a man and which of these is by a woman? Huh? No, no, it's the first part. I cut it off in the middle. I cut it off in the middle, so it's not, the length is not a clue. Um, it, it, I mean, you look at this, and they both look like dry academic literature stuff. At least to me, it does. I don't know. I, don't, I, I wouldn't think that there's any obvious clues here, but who's a man and who's a woman, okay? But we are soon going to see what, what the differences are between male and female writing based on a corpus, and suddenly the answer to this is going to become quite obvious. Okay, so let's talk about the profiling problems that I want to deal with today. Uh, can we, given just some anonymous text, not even a very long text, can we determine the author's gender, the author's age, the author's native language, uh, maybe the author's political preferences? Okay, two problems that I've also written on but won't have time for today are ideological affiliation, uh, personality type. Okay, we've done work on that. Ideological affiliation, by the way, I could tell you, you get it close to 100% accuracy, and on personality type, you're lucky to reach 70% accuracy. Those are very, very different kinds of problems. But we'll deal today with the first four. And I think the main thing you'll remember from this lecture is that this is more accurate than you think and exactly as stereotypical as you think. Okay? Uh, we're going to look at the features that actually distinguish, and it's positively embarrassing. There are universities in the United States where I couldn't even present these results. Um, okay. And um, also, at the end, we'll see whether we can actually be so precise, given, given a text, can we actually determine the specific person who wrote the text, okay? Assuming that we've got thousands and thousands of, of, of candidates, right? Can we, can we figure out the exact person who wrote it? And we'll do that, too. Okay, so the general idea of text categorization is familiar, probably, to everybody. The idea is... You're given, you're given text by, uh, say, type A and type B. There could be, obviously, more than two classes. But for simplicity, let's assume two classes. You pick out the appropriate features. We'll talk a little bit about what features are appropriate momentarily. You represent everything as uh, numerical vectors. Use your favorite learning algorithm, and it spits out a model. Okay, so we're going to use the basic setup of, of machine learning here for all the problems. There's not going to be anything fantastically novel about, uh, about what we do with regard to that. Now, the kinds of features, we're talking about problems of style more than content. The kinds of features that you could use for style, well, you could just say, let's use all the words, right? Just a uh, um, bag, of, bag of words, unigrams. But if you want to focus on style rather than content, you might want to focus only on function words, and, of, the, but, things like that that are unrelated to content. You could use parts of speech. You could use syntax. Usually the way we do syntax is by looking at combinations of parts of speech. So it's more or less the same thing. Morphology, complexity measures, 
idiosyncrasies, by which I mean spelling mistakes and things like that. These are all things you might want to use, uh, depending on the problem. But I can, I can cut right to the punchline, okay? As it turns out, for most problems, function words, and maybe function words together with parts of speech, do all the heavy lifting. Uh, and that's assuming that you want to avoid content, okay? And if you're actually interested in content, because you think that choice of content might be relevant to the problem you're trying to solve, maybe men and women write about different topics, sort of, sometimes. So then you could just use bag of words, okay? The, there's been a lot of papers written trying to generate more and more sophisticated features, but it turns out that the more sophisticated you get, the worse your results are. You want to use the dumbest features possible, okay? Uh, character engrams, which is about as dumb as you could get, turns out to do pretty much everything. Okay, now, let's start with gender. This is work that I did with, uh, uh, with Shlomo Argaman and, and Jonathan Schler going back to 2003. We had 566 documents from the uh, British National Corpus, split among uh, male and female authors evenly, controlled for genre and subgenre. Okay, so these, these were innocent days, 2003. First of all, 566 was an actual number for uh, documents in a corpus. Now, we probably want to have 566 million. Uh, we, we used SVM, as you'll see. Nowadays, we'd probably use uh, deep learning. And gender was a binary problem. So that was then. Um, so anyway, um, Okay, so what did we do? We, we represented all of these documents in terms of uh, function words and parts of speech. We trained, as I said, using uh, SVM, and we evaluated using tenfold cross-validation. Now, the kinds of text we were looking at were not the easy kind that I showed you at the beginning. They were the hard kind, like the, 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 that, academic, that academic paper. Okay, and lo and behold, we actually get more than 80% accuracy, which... I was completely shocked by it. When I say more than 80%, I mean, you know, 80.1%. Um, and, um, but one of the things that we discovered is that you have to look at fiction and nonfiction separately, okay? Fiction and nonfiction are very, very different from each other. But the, the weird thing is that while the scales are different in terms of the frequencies of the features that you expect and so forth, Oddly enough, it was the same exact features that distinguish between male and female writing. It's just that the, the, the scale was, was different. You need two different models, but the same features do all the work. Okay? Now, what are the features that do the work, both in fiction and nonfiction? It turns out that males use many more determiners, that is the word the, adjectives, and the word of as a modifier, part of gold. Right? So uh, it's, that's really a kind of adjective in a way. Uh, and females use more pronouns, they use, among the prepositions, they use for and with more than males do. Uh, negation is used more, and present tense verbs are used more. These are, these are the main features. People who work in corpus linguistics have all sorts of ideas about what kinds of features those are. The male ones you see there are generally called informational features. The female ones here are usually called involvement features, but it doesn't really matter as far as we're concerned. We just threw in the data and, and, and it generated a model, okay? Uh, I'm not interested in interpreting it. You usually get into trouble when you do. So anyway, now let's go back to the, uh, to the texts that we saw before. Uh, uh, we don't have time to, to play a little game where everybody gets to vote. So let's, let, let me just show you. I don't know if you can see the bottom of the screen here. But uh, they're highlighted in red, but it's not quite dark enough. But there are many more many more pronouns in the left one than the right one, which gives us a hint that, according to what I showed you before, that probably the one on the left is a, a female document. But let's move on. Uh, present tense verbs. There are many more present tense verbs in the left one than the right one. That's also a female writing feature. Negation. There are many more negations on the left one than the right. That's another female feature. Uh, the word of appears with much greater density eight times in the shorter thing than five, rather than five times over there, of being a male feature. Okay, once you put on the right glasses after you've seen the models, then you realize that it's very obvious that this is written by a, a, a male and that one is written by a female. In fact, this is by a guy named Paul Simpson and that's by a woman named Susan Blakemore. Okay, so that's, uh, that's, that's gender. We did the same thing with tens of thousands, by the way, of, of documents in, in later experiments. And uh, it, you hit the same 80% ceiling. 80% is pretty much what you get. I, I, the truth of the matter is I'm fairly convinced that if we did 800, whoa, uh, I'm, I'm nowhere. I'm, I haven't even begun. All right, I'm going to speed up now. I'm going to talk so fast. All right, 
Forget that. Forget everything I was about to say. Not important. We did the same thing for age. We had a corpus of 20,000 documents, and we're doing it for age. We used bag of words. We divided it up into three categories, teens, 20s, and older. You get 77% accuracy. The, bas the baseline is 33%. And you could actually, by taking the main info gain features, see exactly the life of a blogger. At the beginning, you're doing homework, but you're bored, and you're boring, and stuff is awesome and crappy. And then you go to college and you have an apartment and you get drunk drinking beer with other students while dating in bars. And then you get a little bit older and you get married and you're running campaigns and paying taxes and you're in the Democratic Party. Okay, so that's pretty much what life is about. Um, okay, age. Native language. Okay, we have a corpus of learner English uh, essays split evenly among Bulgarians, Czechs, Russians, all kinds. The, uh, the people here were all at the same level of proficiency. It's, it's all, all nicely uh, normalized. And uh, take a look at these three examples. I'll tell you that one of them is by a, a Russian speaker, another by a French speaker, another by a Spanish speaker. Can you just look at them and tell which one is written by each of these? Okay, well, yeah, go ahead. You're looking, yeah, but I got no time. <laughs> okay. The last one is indeed... The last one's Russian. Very good, very good. Okay, well, I'll show you what the, the key features are. Okay, we did, uh, we did the usual thing. We put in mistakes, spelling mistakes, using, using a spell checker to find where the mistakes are. Character engrams, did SVM, tenfold cross-validation, 80% accuracy. Okay, 20% baseline in this problem. French speakers mix up AU and OU because those sounds are kind of like similar in French. Uh, Russian speakers, of course, lose the word the a lot because there isn't the in Russian, and they mix up C and K, okay? And Spanish speakers mix up Q and C and M and N because of the nature of Spanish, okay? And lo and behold, you look at the first one, you can see the OU instead of AU in author, that's French, and then consequences with a C instead of a Q, immigrants with an N instead of an M, Spanish, and then the last one missing the the, an Oscar with a K, Russian, okay? Now, political preferences. This is work uh, uh, with uh, with Eti David and uh, Hodaya Uzan uh, and uh, and, uh, and uh, Mayan Geffet. Anyway, we took a Facebook post and we actually got people to tell us which party they voted for in the election. This was in Hebrew in the Israeli elections. They told us their party. We had 450 of them, 150 from the uh, right, 150 from the center, 100 from their left. We, we did it mostly with students in Bar Ilan. It was a little hard to scrape up the lefties. And um, anyway, uh, we used, we used a, a bag of words. The learner was, uh, was Bayesian regression, okay? Now, it turns out that if you actually just look at left and right and you eliminate the center, right? We just did left, right, and center. If you eliminate the, the center, then uh, you get 91% accuracy on left versus right. I want to point out these were not political posts. This is just people writing about the stuff they write about in regular life. You get 91%, you get 79% if you do a three-way thing with left, center, and right. But the really weird thing is that if you didn't train on individual Facebook pages at all, if you just trained on the actual Facebook pages of the political parties, right? So you went to Meritz's Facebook page and Bayat Yehudi's Facebook page, you get all the important words that people who vote for them like to use, okay? So like Baruch Hashem, you can guess, right? It's a, that's how it works. Okay, it, it, so, so, uh, so that's, that's how the game goes. And it turns out you get 82% just doing that, so you don't even have to work hard to get training data. The training data is right out there. The political parties give it to you. Okay, uh, now can we actually find the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the writer's identity? Okay, that's a much harder problem. So let's, let's imagine the kind of problem you have in law enforcement where you've got, say, 10,000 uh, different candidates. And what you have is a 500-word text, okay? And for the, each of the 10,000 suspects, think of them as suspects, you have a few hundred words, maybe a few thousand words, let's say 2,000 words, okay, for each suspect. And what you want to do is find the real way. You're not going to do a regular machine learning thing with 10,000 classes here, okay? Yeah. You're not going to do it with 10,000 classes. That isn't, that isn't going to work. So what do you do? So let's try something simple. Let's go back to the information retrieval model and just say, good, we have text from each of these people. There's we have this text, to which is it most similar, okay? Which is this text most similar to? So, uh, we did that with, the, with our blog corpus of 10,000 bloggers, and we took 500 words just from one of the posts of the blog. Now, it turns out, uh, look over here, 
46% were actually written by the most similar writer, which is way more than I anticipated, right? But of course, 46% isn't great because now you're hanging 54, right? If you're thinking about suspects, you're hanging 54% 54, 54 of the time, you're hanging the wrong person, right? So what do we want to be able to do? What we want to know is, okay, which 46% are the right ones? I'm willing to say I don't know for the other 54%, but just tell me when it's worth guessing, okay? And the answer is that there's a, a lovely algorithm for doing this. And the algorithm is this. What you want to do is you want to change your feature set and see whether the assignment that you had, the most similar writer, actually is robust to changing the feature set. So the algorithm goes this way. We randomly choose uh, some subset of the features. We were using character engrams here as our feature set, 10,000 character engrams. Each time we would just randomly choose 5,000 of them and check who was the most similar. And you could do this as many times as you want, just each time randomly selecting 5,000. So we did this, say, 100 iterations. It more or less converges to whatever it's going to be. And then you say, for how many of the iterations is the most, who won, okay, who won the most iterations? If they won 99 out of 100 iterations, then guess. If they won 20, then don't guess. It turns out 90 is the right, it, right? And then, you know, choosing that K is, is a precision recall trade-off. And the curves you get look like this, okay, which are really nice, just to give you the sense, when you've got 10,000 candidates, you actually guess 30% of the time and say don't know 70%, but in those 30% of the time, you have a 90% precision rate, okay? So this actually, this actually works quite well. This is my last slide, so you can calm down. The, uh, the holy grail of attribution is, I did this for 10,000, it worked. You could, we've done it for more than 10,000. What about the whole internet? What about if I just have a text and I want to know, right? I just want to check the whole internet and say, who wrote this thing, right? Like Satoshi Nakamoto, the Bitcoin guy, right? Just Give me the most of and let me know. For, you can actually do it. You need to use locality-sensitive hashing. I'm not going to get into that, obviously, right now. But it's locality-sensitive hashing is fundamentally a generalization of the method that I just showed you on the previous slide. And we're working on that right now. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, first of all, somebody came to me at lunch and said, I'm working on source code. But, but, uh, but besides for that, yes, th there's been several studies on source code, the most recent of which was just a couple of weeks ago. There's a group in Drexel led by uh, Rachel Greenstadt, and they're, they're working on uh, source code, and they actually have like, really, really strong results on that. So uh, uh, if you're working on that problem, you should look it up. Yeah. Hello. Are there tools, any tools available online for someone wanting to use these abilities? Um, I, not quite yet. I'm, I'm working on doing something with a nice GUI that people could actually use. Right now, there's some goofy thing called Gender Genie, which is based on my models. I, I, I published some stuff that, that gave the main features. So somebody wrote something called the Gender Genie. Uh, the model that they took is a model that only works on, on fiction writing. It doesn't work on nonfiction. It's kind of a toy, but, but, but if you want to play around with it, just, just Google Gender Genie, you'll find it. It's not great, but it's, it's a reasonable toy. Thanks. Last question. So how much uh, text do you need in order to derive all this? Okay, so it, 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 you're talking about the training or, or the, text, the text that you want to test on? Yes, the test that they want the, to The test. one that we're testing on, uh, less than 200 words is not very reliable. 500 is already very good. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Thank you for an interesting talk.